I use a dating site to hopefully find a decent person to go out with and try to make connections. This dating site sadly has a lot of duds and very, very few decent folk available on there. However, I remained optimistic and kept going back to check messages and things. I received a message from a normal looking guy who seemed to have a lot of good things going for him. After a bit of talking, I felt really comfortable giving him my personal phone number, something I rarely ever do. We talked on the phone and found we had many things in common. Both of us were nerdy and had some form of collection of nerdy things. At that point, I really wanted to meet him in person. So we set up a day to go out for some brunch at a local place. He told me he was excited to meet me and I told him that I was excited too. On the day of the date, we had our lovely brunch and talked about various things. He was an extremely tall guy and built like an ox. It was almost a little intimidating, but I do like me some tall guys so that didn't bother me much. After some time talking, he got a text from his mom asking him where he was at and that she needed him to come help her with his dad. He told me after the conversation with his mom that his dad was not doing well and was basically in hospice care at home. I gave my condolences and said it was fine to cut the date off short so he could go take care of his dad. I even told him I'd like to see him again sometime soon when he was able to, which he felt the same about. As we left the restaurant and I headed for my car, we ended up stopping for a short time and conversed just a little longer. But then all of a sudden he asked me if I wanted to feel him. I was taken aback by what he said and asked him what he meant. It was so out of nowhere that I didn't think he meant his groin. I looked around nervously from the parking lot, looking to see if there was anyone nearby that I could flag down for help. Sadly, there was no one, and so my attention turned back to him, afraid of what he might do and him waiting there expectantly for me to touch him. I shakily reached my hand and tried to aim not directly upon his crotch. Then I announced, Oh yeah, ha ha ha, sure can feel it. I laughed nervously and lied, but then he forcefully grabbed my hand and brought it to his groin. Thankfully, I still didn't feel it as I still kind of aimed offset. He asked me if I felt it now and I lied once again and said, yeah, I felt it. I was so afraid and I was at a loss for words. He towered over me like a skyscraper. If he wanted to, he could have easily lifted me up, put a hand over my mouth and shoved me into his car without breaking a sweat. To cut the awkward silence, I said, well, I better go now. He said goodbye and left to go to his car and I torpedoed into my own car and locked the door as soon as I sat on the seat. My hand shook as I gripped the steering wheel and headed home, glancing into my rear mirror to make sure he had not followed me. When I got home, I washed my hands thoroughly, even though I didn't actually touch him. Just the thought of it made me sick and washing my hands made me feel at least slightly better than before. After that day, I never texted him back or answered his phone call. Now, here's where things got more scary. So I knew what his name was, and he had mentioned what his dad's name was. But on my own, I discovered what his middle and last name happened to be. I then used his full name to look up any sort of criminal report, or any information I could obtain about him. I needed to know everything, especially if he was a criminal. The first thing I saw with his full name was an article about a woman whose body was found on the side of the highway in a sleeping bag or a black bag. As I read the article, I noticed certain names being used. First off, his name. It matched. Then later in the article, after reading about what he had done to the woman, they had a portion where the journalist spoke with his parents. Then his dad's nickname came up, the same name he told me his dad's was. To seal the deal that this was the same guy was that the dates and his age matched up. 
he went to prison for only 10 or less years. When he got on the dating site and talked to me, he must have just gotten out of prison about a month before. It all hit me like a ton of bricks at once. I just went on a date with a man who killed a woman, and he never told me. Had I known beforehand, I never ever would have gone out on a date with him. I would have never given him my personal number. Since then, I've hoped he hadn't searched for my address. Suffice to say, I rested uneasy for months since discovering his crime. This is going to be a rather lengthy story, so please bear with me, guys. Back when I was in my early to mid-teens, around 2007 to 2008, me and a bunch of friends would regularly hang out at an old abandoned school. It was a very small school with only eight classrooms, a teacher's room, a cafeteria, two bathrooms, and one room we had no idea what was in since it was always locked, but I'll get back to that later. And this school hadn't been able to keep up with the 80s modernization of our town and the large number of newcomers that followed with it. And as such, it quickly closed down in favor of new schools and buildings by the end of the 80s. Most of the place was boarded up completely, but you could enter through a window in one of the classrooms where the board had been ripped down. Our routine was always the same. Whoever of us got off school first would go down to the building and go through the different rooms to make sure everything was empty and safe, as this building had earlier been known as the local spot for drug addicts, and used needles and such were a common sight for us by this point. So this one day, me and a friend of mine were the first to get out of school, and as per usual, we take the walk down to the building, but upon entering and stepping out from the classroom, and into the hallway, we immediately see a large man. I remember him as quite huge, but that might possibly be how he appeared to us as kids. And my friend lets out a huge scream. The man doesn't appear shocked or scared, and doesn't seem to react to us, but he turns to look at us and then asks, Have you guys seen insert my friend's name here? We tell the guy that we haven't seen anyone and only just got there to which he sighs and shrugs and then pushes past us to leave the same way we just entered. Now our friend has an unusual name, so the chances that this guy was just looking for another random guy who just happened to have the same name were pretty low, but none of us had ever seen this guy before, and I happen to know most of said friend's family as well. When we described what the guy looked like to our friend, he didn't seem to know who this guy could have been either. And for the next few months, we were too scared to go back. When we did return about three or four months later, it was the middle of summer vacation. And we thought it would be fun to climb up on the roof of the building and sunbathe. Upon climbing it, we found the roof to be rather weak and close to caving in but something made us take the risk and dare to venture out on the roof after all. A hole in the roof which we figured would have to be directly above the room we had never been in. The hole in the roof was only about the size of a football, and one of my friends came up with the idea to lower her arm down into the hole and film the room using her phone so that we could all see what the room looked like. She puts her arm down and as she is filming, she suddenly lets out a blood-curdling scream and immediately retracts her arm, but her phone is no longer to be seen. She was certain that something had knocked it from her hand and as we looked down through the hole, we could see her phone laying on the floor. We climbed down from the roof and entered the building, now intent on doing whatever it would take to get in the room so our friend wouldn't have to return home without a phone and have to explain what happened. About 30 minutes later, we finally managed to make a hole in the door and put our hands inside, and when we try to use the door handle on the inside of the door, the door now opens without any trouble. We step inside and we all stare in silence. To this day, I have no idea what this room was doing in a school building 
and I sincerely hope it has never been used for what it looked like it was intended for. The room is about 4x4 four four meters and the floor and walls are all of solid concrete. In the left corner of the room from where we entered was two metal bowls sitting on the floor, and at the back of the room was five chains dangling from the wall. Four with equal-sized cuffs and one large that looked like it would fit around a neck. Needless to say, we swiftly picked up my friend's phone and immediately left the place. However, the room had us both scared but also slightly intrigued. So after some talk back and forth that same night, we decided to go back to look at it again the following day. When we returned the next day, we found the door to be locked once again and someone had covered the hole we made in the door with a large wooden board nailed on the door. Once again, we immediately left, and after that visit, we never returned. I have no idea what we stumbled upon that day, but I am certain my days hanging out at this place is what sparked my interest in abandoned places. Today, I am an experienced member of the Urbex community and have had much more sinister experiences with places like this that I might share with y'all some other time. Since taking up Urbex, it has been a dream of mine to go back to that school and check if that room was still there, but unfortunately the place no longer exists and the area is now home to a thrift store. I was 19 at the time, around 2009. I had a weekday off work. I decided to go to the beach by myself and brought my guitar along. This was rural Northern California where the beaches are below cliff faces and usually empty of other people. There was a particular beach where someone had built a driftwood hut into the side of a steep cliff with the beach about 100 feet below. You can just barely see the roof of the structure from the highway. I had always wanted to check it out, so I parked my car on the highway and made my way along a narrow trail to the hut. It was a beautiful day, so I sat up near one of the hut's windows and was playing my guitar and watching the waves. Suddenly, I hear someone else walking down the trail. I'm a little nervous, but figure it must be well known to locals or something. Then enters the man. Immediately, I get major creepy vibes from him. He is in his late 50s, overweight, unshaven, thick glasses, sloppy, dirty clothes, sweatpants, and a dirty white shirt, but not homeless or anything. He immediately initiates conversation with me. First, just nice pleasantries, talking about the view and the weather. Then he starts asking personal questions. Do you live around here? Do you go to college? Are you working today? Are you here with anyone? I answer very vaguely and I'm starting to get uncomfortable and feel trapped. The hut is very long and narrow and there's no way for me to get to the trail leading back to the car without passing by him. At this point, I only say the bare minimum trying to show him I'm not interested in conversation. I look away and he snaps a picture of me on his disposable camera. I ask him what he is doing and he says he wants to show his friends back home how beautiful the girls in California are. At this point I start brainstorming my options. I can try to run past him but I will have to get close. I can jump out the windows of the hut towards the ocean but it's a pretty steep cliff face to the beach 100 feet or more below. My gut started telling me this was a dangerous situation, but I was frozen. I didn't know what to do. Then he tells me that he needs to go to his truck to get something. Something about his camera. But I knew he had already used his camera. He leaves the hut, but there's still no way for me to get to my car without passing him. I'm brainstorming what to do. But I kept thinking, maybe I'm overreacting. I run to the entrance of the hut, but he's already making his way back down the trail towards me. This is the gross part. He has a very large invisible erection in his sweatpants and he has something under his arm. 
I run to the opposite side of the hut and jump out of the window, sitting on the ledge of the steep cliff. In that split second where I had to make a decision, I look in the sky and see two hawks fighting each other. I had just read The Alchemist, and if you remember, the universe sends the main character omens and signs. One particular omen in the book is two fighting raptors, which ended up meaning something bad was coming and to run. In that moment, I knew I had to scale the steep cliff to the beach below. I decided I'd rather die falling or die swimming across the river. The beach below was also the estuary to a large river. Then find out what the creep was planning. So I started scaling the steep cliff. He ran to the edge and asked where I was going. He yelled for me to come back. Adrenaline kicked in so hard I made it down surprisingly fast without falling or getting hurt. Luckily, he didn't follow. He stood there the entire time yelling for me to come back. I was shaking. I made it to the beach and hid in some vegetation for what felt like forever but was probably only 20 minutes. I finally decided it was safe to walk down the beach to where the actual trail was. I could see a man standing at the top. It wasn't him. I could tell by the silhouette, but I was terrified he had an accomplice. I decided to risk it and run up and ask for help. It ended up being a park ranger. I told him the whole story. We walked to the hut and the creep was gone. He put out a radio call so enforcement would be on the watch and I filed a police report. When I left abruptly, I left my purse and all my stuff in the hut. It was all still there when I returned with the ranger, but I was terrified that he went through my belongings and saw my address on my ID. For months afterward, I was scared to be alone at home. I think the creep would have done something awful if I had stayed in the hut that day. I think he might have gone to his truck for a weapon or rope or something. But I'm not sure since I couldn't see what he was tucking under his arm. At 19, I didn't know to trust my gut. Now I know not to worry about what anyone thinks if I feel danger and the need to bolt. I'm not religious or anything, but I thank the universe for sending me a very clear sign at such a pivotal moment. Nothing ever came of the report, but sometimes I search for that town name in crimes in case I ever recognize his mugshot. This happened before Christmas 2019, when I was a 26-year-old female and it sticks with me to this day. I've thought about sharing this many times, but I was never sure if it was scary enough. I guess you can decide. My then boyfriend, now husband, and I decided to meet for dinner at a Christmas market here in Switzerland. He would pick up our dog from doggy daycare and I would get there after work. Some things that are good to know. At that point, we'd had our dog for about a year. He's called Bean, he's a medium-sized dog, and before he came to Switzerland, he was a street dog in Italy. He was about two and a half years old at that time, and he loved and still loves to get all the attention he can get. Also, Christmas markets are incredibly busy here, especially after work. People will meet there with friends to eat dinner and drink mulled wine. When we got to this Christmas market, we realized that it was way too busy to walk through with a dog. And I sent my boyfriend off to get my favorite street food, Malawatch. I waited at the edge of the market with Bean. Bean likes to greet everyone who looks at him. And by that point, I had gotten used to talking with strangers because my dog wanted to meet them. So I wasn't too concerned at first when a dude came up to me. Full transparency, I don't remember word for word what was said. I'm not even sure what language this happened in. I do remember that Bean happily greeted this guy, trying to stand up against him and licking his hands. The guy asked for his name and what breed he is. And I told him that Bean is a pincher mix. That's when the situation started to turn. The man insisted that he must be a Basenji and asked how I could say he's a pincher. 
All of a sudden, he switched. There's no better word to explain it. He grabbed Bean's leash and said, I'll go now and just try to walk off with my dog. Thankfully, I had a firm grip on his leash. I was incredibly confused and flustered and just stammered that he can't take my dog. He got increasingly more angry with every second that I didn't let go of the leash. I loudly told him to leave me alone and Bean started to bark at the man. I've never seen Bean this angry and scared at the same time, and thankfully the man let go of the leash and slipped into the crowd. I was left standing there a dumbfounded mess with a mess of a dog. Bean was barking and shaking, so I knelt down to calm him down, holding him and talking to him. My boyfriend was still somewhere in the crowd waiting for our food. After a while, a woman walked up to me and told me not to put my heel to the floor, as she'd just seen someone put a firecracker there. I don't know the name for this type of firecracker, they are small, like a quarter inch, and usually thrown at the floor to make a little boom sound on impact. Someone had put them under the heel of my shoe so it would explode when I put my heel down to get up. Now I don't know what's worse. Was it the same guy that tried to steal Bean? Or was it someone else who saw a distressed dog and thought, wow, let's scare that dog a bit more? I think the worst thing for me was that, apart from that woman who warned me, no one helped me when I was harassed by a weird guy, even though I loudly told him to go away, and there were other people standing very close, just watching. Bean was the one who scared off the guy in the end. Thankfully, the events of that evening had no lasting impact on Bean. He still loves to greet strangers. I still remember it and don't think I will ever forget.